Good afternoon. I'm John Holman. I'm Vice President Medical Affairs at Transplant Genomics. I want to thank all of you for joining us for our symposium on the path beyond COVID-19, management of kidney transplant patients using TrueGraph for surveillance. We have an outstanding group of speakers this afternoon who will share their experiences using TrueGraph, especially in these challenging times. So let's begin. Our first speaker is John Friedewald. Dr. Friedewald is a transplant nephrologist and an associate professor of medicine and surgery at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. He has an extensive clinical and research experience with the TrueGraph assay, and John will share with us an overview of the TrueGraph assay. John. Here's my disclosure slide. So let's start with what TrueGraph is. TrueGraph was designed with a specific purpose. So some tests are born looking for a disease. We actually started with a specific disease and developed the TrueGraph test. TrueGraph is a blood gene expression profile developed specifically to detect the absence of subclinical rejection in stable kidney transplant recipients. So what is subclinical acute rejection? How do we define it? Actually, we define it very tightly. It was defined by three things. Having normal renal function, defined as a serum creatinine less than 2.3, stable renal function, less than 20% change from the prior values, and you have to have rejection on a surveillance biopsy. That defines subclinical acute rejection. And we've learned a lot about subclinical rejection in the last couple of years. Uh, on top here is a paper that we did uh, reporting the findings of the CTOD-8 trial where we developed and validated a novel blood-based biomarker for subclinical acute rejection after kidney transplant. But also, and importantly, we further defined in a large multicenter trial the frequency and importance of subclinical rejection, critically that even borderline infiltrates or rejection are meaningful in terms of effect on clinical endpoints. These findings were echoed in several other important publications in the following year. A group from Pittsburgh, from the University of Alabama, Birmingham, the GOCAR study led by Barbara Murphy, and the group from Australia all published papers showing very similar clinical findings related to the disease of subclinical acute rejection. So how often does this happen? Is this a rare disease? And the answer is no, it's actually fairly common. In the CTOD-8 trial, for instance, all patients had surveillance biopsies done at 3, 12, and 24 months after the transplant. And what we found was that there was about a 20% point prevalence at 3 months, 25% at 12 months, and it persisted. 25% of people had it at 24 months. Overall, 35%, one in three patients in the study had at least one biopsy with subclinical rejection in the first two years. So it's a common finding. And we also found that about 80% of the rejections detected on biopsy were read as BAMF borderline infiltrates, with 20% being 1A or greater or antibody-mediated rejection. And subclinical antibody-mediated rejection is defined the same way. Stable renal function, normal renal function, but a biopsy showing rejection. So what are the consequences of subclinical rejection? Now, this is the so what part. Well, so what has been shown that subclinical rejection is associated very tightly with higher risk of going on to later develop clinical acute rejection. That's where you have an increase in serum creatinine. People in all these studies were more likely to form de novo DSA if they had subclinical rejection. They were more likely to lose their graft at five years, more likely to develop graft fibrosis on a biopsy at two years, and they had a more rapid loss of GFR over the course of these studies. And this is just some of the figures from the studies. This is the GOCAR study showing that those that had subclinical rejection at three months versus that didn't had a lower graft survival out to five years, statistically significant. This is data from the Australia group showing progressive interstitial fibrosis in those that had subclinical rejection versus those that didn't. These same findings were found, by the way, in the GOCAR study and the CTOD-8 study. I'm just showing individual representative samples here. And then in the CTOD-8 study, this is de novo DSA, we found that patients that had no subclinical rejection had lower rates of both class 1 and class 2 de novo DSA compared to those that had at least one episode or multiple episodes of subclinical rejection, much higher rates of de novo class 1 and class 2 uh, donor-specific antibodies. So all things that are bad in terms of graft outcomes associated with subclinical rejection. So how do we discover the test and what is the test? TrueGraph is a gene expression test, and the way we did this is we got a large group of patients from these trials, a bunch of patients that had normal biopsies, normal function, and stable function. That was called TX, or transplant excellence. Then we had a large group that had subclinical acute rejection, again, defined, as I said earlier, with stable function, normal function, but a biopsy showing rejection. And we took these two groups and looked at their blood and ran a gene expression profile using an affymetric gene chip. And we come up with a bunch of genes that can be put through this bioinformatics pathway shown here, and we create what's called a random forest model. And what that does is it asks the question, what are the set of genes that best tell these two groups apart? 
for a very specific reason. And what we found, the TrueGraph gene expression profile consists of 120 genes that are either up or down regulated and specifically chosen to distinguish stable normal biopsies from those with subclinical rejection. So again, this is a test designed for a specific disease, and it's very good at detecting and different, differentiating those two diseases. How does this test perform? Um, it's been shown now in other, other cohorts. This is a paper published looking at patients from seven transplant centers shown here using the TrueGraph test. And what we find is very consistent, a very high negative predictive value around, eight, around 89 or 90 percent, meaning that if you have a negative TrueGraph test, which is a TX result, transplant excellent, there's a 90 percent chance that that biopsy would show a normal biopsy. The positive predictive value is lower, right around 50%, if you have a non-TX result, which is the opposite. And you can see the consistency of the accuracy of the TX result across the sites in this one study that was published. So now what I want to do is walk through a few actual patient uh, examples to see how biomarkers can be used in managing stable patients. And I'm combining this here with the TrueGraph test, another test called the TRAC test, which is a cell-free DNA assay. And so this patient, this is an example of subclinical rejection, subclinical AMR. So here's a patient that's transplanted, and they're followed for 24 months in the trial. And importantly, all these biomarker results were obtained retrospectively so that they were not used at the time of this trial. This was an observational trial, so they did not inform the management. Only the biopsies informed the management. All patients underwent protocol biopsies. So this patient had a protocol biopsy at three months per the protocol. The true graph assay was TX, transplant excellent, which means that it's likely there'll be a negative biopsy, and sure enough, the biopsy was negative. So this is an example where if you had a TX blood result, you could avoid doing this biopsy and be fairly certain that you're not missing subclinical rejection. The patient had, uh, again, retrospective, a cell-free DNA track assay done, and this is below the point of the cutoff of 0 0.69, so it was a negative assay as well. You can see the patient had excellent and normal renal function that was stable throughout the 24 months. So again, if you didn't do biopsies or didn't do biomarkers and just followed serum creatinine, you would think this person was doing fine. But in fact, what happened to this patient, as they move on now at four, six, and nine months, at 12 months, they again go uh, undergo a uh, protocol biopsy. At this point, the true graph assay is non-TX, so it would tell us that probably there's at least a 50% chance that there's something going on other than a normal biopsy. In fact, the patient is found to have subclinical antibody-mediated rejection. And interestingly as well, we know that a cell-free DNA, the track assay, is a very sensitive assay for endothelial injury, often caused by antibody-mediated rejection. And so in this patient, the cell-free DNA pops up as well and stays up here as the person's being treated. They're treated with rituximab and IVIG. <clears throat> now, one of the things we found in the CTOT trial, and other people have shown as well, is that subclinical inflammation is very persistent. We think we treat it successfully, but if we don't do a follow-up biopsy or biomarker, we may be missing incomplete treatment of the, of the disease. And in fact, that's what happened in this patient. So three months later, they undergo another biopsy, again, with perfect stable renal function, but they have subclinical antibody-mediated rejection. Again, the true graph assay is non-TX, suggesting that that's what we would find. And still, the, the uh, cell-free DNA assay is persistently elevated. They're again treated with another round of IVIG. Now the cell-free DNA assay drops. And one of the real, probably, benefits of cell-free DNA is monitoring response to therapy, particularly for antibody-mediated rejection. Cell-free DNA comes down. Creatinine stays stable. The patient goes on the study. And at month 24, has another biopsy. Now the true graph assay is TX, and the biopsy is back to normal. So, in, in a sense, we could have potentially avoided two biopsies for this patient, but in the meantime, done uh, bio, biomarker-guided biopsies here to detect subclinical injury and treat it successfully and then monitor response to therapy with a cell-free DNA and a true graph assay. And the next example, another patient, again, same, same setup here, patient's transplanted, um, has early uh, blood samples done, again, retrospectively. Pretty good kidney function, creatinine 1.3 at month two. They have a first uh, true graph assay, which is non-TX. Turns out we don't have a biopsy at that time, but it's likely a false positive. Uh, by the second month, the, TX, the, the true graph test is TX, suggesting that things are quiescent. At month three, again, a TX true graph result. Biopsy is done. Red is normal. Mild fibrosis and tubular atrophy, grade one. <clears throat> by month 12, now there's a gap here of nine months. By month 12, creatinine is still pretty stable here. Um, uh, true graph assay is TX, and again, the biopsy is normal. Uh, at this point, cell-free DNA is also run at 0 0.42 using the track test, and that's below the cutoff for positive, so everything's doing fine at this point. Now, this patient, uh, there's a gap here of about eight months. Uh, the patient at month 20 uh, has a rise in serum creatinine. You can see up to 2.0, almost 
They're, they have a four cause biopsy done. Now, now uh, TrueGraph has not indicated it during the times of, of uh, an instability. So this patient doesn't have stable renal function, so we don't do a TrueGraph, but they have a biopsy and it shows uh, AMR and with some potentially chronic features. Um, patients treated with steroids, IVIG and plasmapheresis. Um, two months later, they have a repeat TrueGraph assay. It's still non-TX. And we can see that um, cell-free DNA is run here. Now it's positive and still going up at month 22 and 24. Sure enough, in month 24, they're re-biopsied, still with a non-TX TrueGraph. And again, they still have some clinical AMR. And now they progress to second degree uh, interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. <clears throat> and the patient, again, is then retreated. And what this tells us is the patient probably wasn't adequately treated here, um, and either the increasing cell-free DNA and or the positive, the non, non-TX true graph, would have indicated that maybe we should have biopsied this person earlier. Again, being an observational trial, these test results were not available at the time. Another example, again, of subclinical rejection, this one's a combination of cellular and antibody-mediated rejection. And again, it highlights that if you look at the serum creatinine here in orange, if you just follow creatinine without biomarkers or biopsies, you would be missing a lot of things in a patient. So here's a patient transplanted, again, good kidney function. At month three, they have a TX, true graph, so you could have avoided a biopsy, but the biopsy's done, and it was normal. And again, they have a low level of tract cell-free DNA. Patient cooks along here, doing well at month 12. Now they have a non-TX um, True graph, biopsy's done, and sure enough, they have borderline subclinical rejection with now grade one IFTA, which wasn't apparent at uh, month three. Um, now, we don't, again, in the study, we didn't have these uh, true graph assays along the way here, but the question is whether earlier on this would have led us to intervene back here and avoid some of the fibrosis we see. But the patient decided that the clinician treating the patient at the time decided not to treat the patient based on borderline infiltrates. Again, the patient has stable function. All they go here, uh, with these intense monitoring visits a few weeks later, a month later, and then three months later, they have a non-TX, persistent non-TX, again, a biopsy is done, still showing borderline acute cellular rejection. Now the patient's developed the Novo DSA and antibody immunity rejection. At that time as well, TRAC is done, cell-free DNA is positive, patients treated with steroids, IVIG, and rituximab, um, and they continue on here. Unfortunately, um, several months later, uh, still with stable renal function, they have a non-TX, uh, true graph assay at 24 months, biopsies done, still showing AMR. At that time, the cell-free DNA assays really shot up here to 9 and almost 10. Again, treated with another round of steroids, plasmapheresis is added now in IVIG. The DSA get better and the patient improves. So again, if you're just looking at CM creatinine, you're missing the picture here. The last case I think I want to present here is a patient that underwent HLA desensitization. And again, um, when we think about the tests we use and the biomarkers we use, you have to understand the patient population that you're treating and what their pretest probability is. So this patient is transplanted um, and under the protocol for desensitization had a one-month biopsy. At the time, the TrueGraph assay was TX. Biopsy was read as normal. Interestingly, good, good renal function here, creatinine 0.8. Um, at that time, a cell-free DNA assay was above the cutoff of 0.69, so it was positive. So the track assay is positive. Three months, patient has their standard three-month biopsy. Again, it's normal. True graph assay is TX, and the cell-free DNA now is slightly higher. Patient, again, is monitored with their renal function. Six months, nine months doing well. At 10 months, still stable function, but now they develop proteinuria, and a four-cause biopsy is done at that time, showing subclinical, because the kidney function is stable and normal, subclinical antibody and cellular rejection. Now, interestingly, as we go back and look, the cell-free DNA track assay has shot way up here at almost seven and a half, and then at the time of biopsy, is still almost five. Treatment uh, with steroids and IVIG is given as well as increasing baseline immunosuppression. The cell-free DNA assay uh, continues to improve. Uh, gap in time here from 13 months to 24 months, but by 24 months, uh, still stable function with the same creatinine they started with. The true graph assay is back to TX, and the biopsy is back to normal. So in summary, I hope the data and some of these clinical examples have shown you that TrueGraph is really the only available non-invasive biomarker to rule out subclinical rejection reliably in stable patients. And by doing that, you can avoid the need for protocol biopsies. Now, some centers don't perform protocol biopsies, but as I showed you, if you're just monitoring serum creatinine, you may be missing subclinical disease, which may be clinically very relevant for your patient. Again, subclinical rejection is common. 35% of patients in a large cohort study developed it in the first two years and was associated with inferior graft outcomes, which are important. Further episodes of acute rejection, donor-specific antibodies, lower GFR, fibrosis, and graft loss. 
Monitoring with TrueGraph can provide confidence that your patient's not having subclinical rejection and prevent the need for invasive biopsies. Or, or um, conversely, you can do a biomarker-guided biopsy that may detect subclinical injury and allow treatment. And again, cell-free DNA is a reliable marker of endothelial injury, most often caused by antibody-mediated rejection. It can help in the management of patients with ongoing antibody-mediated rejection. With that, I'd like to thank you. Uh, I appreciate you attending today, and I look forward to the next time we can talk and meet in person. Our next speaker is Dr. Clifton Q. Dr. Q is the Medical Director of Kidney and Pancreas Transplantation at the University of Alabama. UAB was a participant in the early development of TrueGraph. Dr. Q will share with us the longer-term follow-up of the UAB patients that were monitored using TrueGraph. Dr. Q. Here's some of the issues of doing surveillance biopsies at a, at a, as a, at a busy transplant center. Well, we're a large center. Uh, we're the only transplant program in the state of Alabama. We usually perform more than 250 kidney transplants per year. And trying to arrange all these surveillance biopsies creates some logistical problems. So at our center, some of the key issues are overburdened staff. I mean, we never feel that we have enough people to get the job done. We need people to call the patients and arrange for them to come in. We, they, we need to make sure that they've taken their antihypertensives. We need to make sure that they're NPO and all that sort of, of stuff. And then we have to find a place for them to get their biopsy done. Frequently, our ultrasound suites are overbooked, and it may take several weeks in a surveillance situation to get those biopsies scheduled. And then we have patients that say, hey, I'm doing okay. Why do I even need to come in? And I, I'm, I feel great. I, I don't think I need a biopsy. We also have patients on anticoagulation, and now we have to do some thinking because now we have to weigh the risks of withholding anticoagulation versus the benefits of having the biopsy. And there may be patients that we would never want to hold anticoagulation, and patients that come to mind are those that are on uh, or that have uh, mechanical heart valves. And then we have a huge area that we serve between 250 miles or more from, from Birmingham, and, and there are people that just don't have the money to come in for an extra visit. And then the current COVID-19 pandemic, patients are sim simply reluctant to come in because they don't want to get exposed. And we recently opened up our evaluation clinic and are having difficulty filling slots because Patients are genuinely afraid. And then the pathologists, because they're already reading all the four cause biopsies that we do, all the time zero biopsies that we do, all the native biopsies that we do, and now we're adding another 200 or so additional biopsies for them to read. So I think that a blood test to reduce the dependence upon surveillance biopsy would be an asset, a major step forward for a program such as ours and for probably many programs across the country. So what did we do? So we looked at 116 consecutive kidney transplant recipients. At our program, it's standard of care for all our patients to have a surveillance biopsy at, at six months. And we do a not just a biopsy, but we do a donor-specific antibody, we do a BKPCR, we do medication uh, doses and levels. And so we do this whole, what we call an, an immune surveillance. For the biopsy, uh, both a creatinine and true graph were collected. The true graph results were compared with histology. And we also did a survey of the investigators on the clinical utility of true graph to see if they felt comfortable uh, ordering true graph in the future. So, of the 116 kidney transplant recipients that were assessed, 26 were excluded because they ultimately never had their biopsy done, or there was a quality control issue with the test. So the final analysis included 90 patients, 59 were deceased donor recipients, and 31 were living donor transplant recipients. The demographics were kind of what we would expect to see in a program such as ours. 60% uh, were African American, 37% were Caucasian, the remainder were Asian and Hispanic. The mean age was 49 years old with a range between 21 and 78. 60% uh, were men, 40% were women, and the mean serum creatinine was 1.38.
So what did we find? In eight patients, both the biopsy and true graft were not TX. They agreed with each other and said, hey, there's a problem. In 57 patients, the biopsy and true graft also agreed that everything was okay. Both were TX. There were 15 false positives where the true graft said, hey, there may be a problem, but the biopsy ultimately showed everything was okay. And then in 10, there were false negatives where the biopsy said there is a problem, but the true graft result was TX and said everything was okay. So what were the performance metrics? Well, the accuracy was 85%. The negative predictive value was 81%. Positive predictive value was 40%. Sensitivity, 44%. And the specificity was 78%. So how did we fare with clinical utility? Well, here are the three questions that we asked. Did true graft results support your decision on how to manage a patient with stable serum creatinine? Answer yes or no. Number two, how did true graft support your decision? Did it indicate the patient is stable and no intervention was needed? Reported a change in patient management, informed need for additional testing, informed the need for a biopsy, or supported avoiding a biopsy. And question three, does true graft result uh, encourage you to use true graft in serial testing in future patient management? And the answer to question one was 70%, seven, 77% was yes. And the true graft supported the decision on how investigators answered A and E, 71%, that indicated that the true graph result indicated the patient was stable and no intervention was needed and supported avoiding a kidney biopsy. And the answer to question three is that over three quarters said that they would be encouraged to use true graph in the future uh, in a serial testing fashion. In summary, true graph correctly identified 57 patients whose biopsy could have been avoided. So that's 57 procedures that could have been avoided. And even though the risks of allograft biopsy are pretty low, when they do happen, they can be catastrophic. So if we can avoid any biopsies, I, I think it's to the benefit of our patients. Graph correctly identified eight patients whose biopsy was justified. So, you know, so these are people, True Graph said not TX. And so those people we would proceed with a biopsy to make sure that that's the case. On the other side, there were 15 patients that had a biopsy unnecessarily because true graft was not TX, but the biopsy came back TX or oh, everything was fine. And then there are 10 patients where subclinical rejection would have been missed. 7% of the clinicians reported that true graft supported their patient management decisions. So what does this all mean? Can we avoid surveillance biopsy? The answer, I think, is yes. And I think using TrueGraph would help. What are some things that we can do to maybe increase the accuracy? Well, we can look and try to stratify some of the patients. Uh, there may be patients that uh, I don't care what anything says, they need a, a surveillance biopsy. Uh, there may be patients that, that you know, maybe we can, maybe we could uh, do proactive serial testing. And if we get so many not TX, well, they need a biopsy. Uh, could we throw donor-specific antibody results in, kind of modify our decision-making? Should we take into account medication levels and doses or history of non-adherence? Maybe we should take into account the sensitization status of the patient and kind of and what we're going to do based upon a combination of all these things. But what are some of the other applications of TrueGraph in a program such as ours? So could we use it to, uh, as a monitoring tool during uh, minimization of immunosuppression? So you, you've had your, 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 your TX, maybe these are, you don't have a lot of uh, uh, risk factors for immunologic injury. Maybe we could just keep checking a, a true graph to make sure we're doing the right thing by cutting back on the medicine. Could we use it as a tool following the treatment of rejection? So somebody's not TX, we do a biopsy, they have rejection, we treat them, and then we could monitor them afterwards and make sure they're TX afterwards. 
What about uh, evaluating patients on anticoagulation or those that just can't get to the transplant center? I mean, we have the proverbial patient that lives in Mobile that's 250 miles away. They bump their creatinine and maybe the better thing uh, to do uh, would be to get a true graph, a DSA, and those things are not abnormal to have them stay down there. Or if they do come up with a problem, then I think we would be more justified to bring them up to clinic and risk getting some kind of an exposure. So true graph has some really important advantages in all these situations because I can manage patients locally. That would be good. So I'd like to thank uh, Roz Mannon, who really uh, spearheaded this work while she was here at UAB. She's currently at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Audrey Ange, who's a medical student and is going to be graduating from medical school next year. She put the data together and was really instrumental in getting it into a form that could be analyzed. And of course, I'd, I'd like to thank Transplant Genomics and all their support for getting this done. I encourage everybody to come virtually and see the poster, board number C336, and check it out. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Our next speaker is Ethan Moran. Dr. Moran is a nephrologist and an assistant professor of medicine at Yale School of Medicine. He's an active researcher in areas of renal physiology. Dr. Moran will share Yale's recent experience with monitoring renal allograft function in the age of COVID-19. Dr. Moran. We um, very carefully monitor our patients in the, uh, the time period immediately after the transplant. We have over 20 clinic visits scheduled in the first year after transplant, including two a week in month one, one, one a week in month two, and two in the third month. Uh, with all these visits, we do a whole panel of lab studies, including traditional biomar biomarkers of kidney function, like creatinine and urinary albumin. We also do four-cause biopsies at any time uh, when we suspect um, trouble with the allograft. And further, at the six-month mark, we do a protocol biopsy. Um, our practice has been um, uh, to treat rejection when we find it on these protocol biopsies according to the table shown here. Uh, so we, of course, treat antibody-mediated and, and severe T-cell uh, mediated rejections aggressively, but we also treat borderline and BAMF1A cellular rejections with a steroid pulse and taper. Uh, and once the treatment is over, we increase the basal immunosuppression as well. So why, why do protocol biopsies? Well, the logic is as follows, that the traditional biomarkers that we follow uh, for creatinine, uh, proteinuria, are relatively insensitive and relatively nonspecific for rejection in other pathologies. And we think that the literature suggests, uh, although we acknowledge some controversy, uh, that uh, significant fractions of newly transplanted patients will have subclinical rejection, meaning rejection not indicated by elevations in creatinine. Further, subclinical rejection untreated is associated with, with worse graft outcomes. And finally, that if we can treat, um, treat rejection when we find it, uh, based on these protocol biopsies, uh, we can improve graft outcomes. So the gold standard for detecting these subclinical rejections has been the kidney biopsy. And the biopsy can pick up, of course, a wide range of different types of rejection and also other pathologies such as tubular atrophy and fibrosis and infection due to bacterial and viral sources. So despite those advantages of the biopsy, there are uh, many clear disadvantages. Anyone who uh, participated in a, in a kidney biopsy program uh, familiar with the risks. Um, a significant amongst them is bleeding. The uh, kidney is a very vascular organ. Poking it with a needle uh, is fraught, and bleeding uh, uh, can happen with an, uh, an appreciable um, uh, frequency. Uh, shown below is actually uh, some ultrasound and CT images of a uh, consequences of a biopsy in our practice where the patient developed an AD chilla that led to a subcapsular hematoma shown in this uh, ultrasound image that ultimately required operative intervention. So the allograft can be damaged by a biopsy and can surrounding structures. And the risks is heightened in many of our patients that have intraperitoneal grafts or need anticoagulation. Biopsies cause a lot of patient stress. They use up a lot of clinical resources. 
And there are well-known difficulties in interpretation, including sampling error and inter-observer uh, variation. So uh, layered on top of those existing difficulties with um, kidney biopsies has been, uh, for us, the COVID-19 pandemic. New Haven, Connecticut, the, the home to the Yale School of Medicine, has been particularly hard hit. We're just 70 miles from New York City. Uh, the small state of Connecticut has had over 3,000 deaths. Uh, Yale New Haven Hospital had uh, over 400 COVID inpatients at one point. Our MICU service had be tripled in size. And our living donor transplant program had to be suspended. And the deceased donor program severely curtailed. Our transplant clinic was nearly emptied out with visits converted to telehealth. And in this environment, our protocol biopsy program became very difficult to uh, continue. So this prompted us to um, accelerate a process that was already underway for us, and that is the examination of non-invasive methods of detecting subclinical rejection so as to replace the protocol biopsies during this period of time. So we um, began a review of the commercially available tests that were out there uh, and found there's basically two technologies at present. The first um, is technology and testing based on the detection of donor-derived cell-free DNA. And the principle is that um, when the allograft is injured, cells die and release DNA, donor-derived DNA, which then circulates in the peripheral blood. Uh, this donor-derived cell-free DNA can be identified and quantified using uh, next-generation sequencing technique. And um, this technique has been uh, uh, studied in a number of publications. Most of the patients studied so far have been in the context of four-cause biopsies, um, not, not protocol biopsies. And uh, the data show that the cell-free DNA is actually pretty good at picking up severe rejections, antibody-aid-mediated rejections and, and severe T-cell-mediated rejections. However, it's, it's pretty insensitive to borderline and, and BAMF1A rejection. Um, the other technology that's out there, uh, commercially available, of course, uh, is the peripheral blood gene expression profiling test. And these tests are uh, based on the concept that um, panels of genes and their expression profiles can be measured in peripheral blood and can be identified so as to um, uh, reveal the presence of subclinical rejection. And these tests were specifically developed and studied to develop to detect subclinical rejection. Um, a number of different groups have identified them. The one that's been commercialized, of course, is, uh, and is commercially available at present is the TrueGraph test, which was based on a gene expression profile test developed primarily at, at Northwestern University. And clinically, these tests have been studied extensively in uh, the context of patients who would otherwise get protocol biopsies, meaning patients with a stable creatinine below an absolute value of 2.3. The threshold um, for this test was um, chosen so as to essentially negative predictive value, um, 90%. And the concept is a negative test allows uh, a practitioner to forego a protocol biopsy with relatively high confidence of not missing a, a clinical rejection. So with this information in mind, uh, we uh, instituted the following plan in our own practice. We suspended protocol biopsies uh, back in early March as, as the COVID pandemic was hitting us. And we plan to substitute um, our protocol biopsy with the peripheral blood gene expression profile, the true graph test. And uh, positive tests would be followed up with a biopsy and negative tests we would uh, continue to monitor. We have continued to do a clear four cause biopsies when indicated. And we have incorporated cell free DNA testing, but in the context of these four cause biopsies and patients who are deemed risky to biopsy for different reasons. In particular, patients with new DSA, uh, where we're trying to ascertain the clinical significance, um, we've used the cell free test as well. Um, we, uh, as with any new test or any new technology, we brought into a, a couple of challenges in incorporating the new test. Uh, the first has been the need to uh, add the test to the Yale New Haven Hospital electronic medical record, which is epic in our case, and prepare our hospital blood draw station to be able to appropriately perform the test. Um, this has been accomplished, um, but, but took a little bit of effort. Um, the second issue to be addressed has been insurance coverage. Uh, Medicare pays for the uh, the TrueGraph data, 
but some of the private insurers in particular have required lengthy pre-authorization uh, processes to, uh, to pay for the debt. And this has been challenging uh, in particular because we've had staffing shortages due to COVID-19 with several of our um, nurse coordinators being pulled away to do uh, in-hospital duty on COVID floors. Lastly, we had to um, embark on a process of educating uh, the transplant group at large uh, to make sure everyone's aware of the characteristics of the uh, gene expression profiling test and has an understanding of the appropriate time to order the test and how to interpret the results. So going forward, um, I think uh, that this is a fast-moving field and um, you know, we've had to make a lot of changes in our practice due to COVID. I think many of those changes, such as an increased use of telehealth, are probably going to stay with us. And likewise, I think an increased use of non-invasive measures um, of allograft monitoring, uh, such as TrueGAF, are likely to remain part of our practice going forward, even after the COVID pandemic recedes. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the, the field is fast moving. There's already studies underway to examine the performance of different non-invasive tests in a wider range of clinical settings. A number of new tests are under development and, and publication suggest new technologies on the way, uh, including tests that are based on combinations of different analytes, which will hopefully yield uh, improved sensitivity and specificity. Um, and uh, with that, I, uh, I will conclude, and I thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss our, uh, our practice uh, at the Young and Haven Hospital Transplant Program. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Germain. Dr. Germain is a transplant nephrologist at Bay State Medical Center and is a professor of medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine. One of his research interests is the predictors of progressive loss of renal allograft function. Dr. Germain will also share his center's recent experience with using TrueGraph as surveillance during COVID-19. Dr. Germain. Our immunosuppression protocol in our program is CAMPATH induction monotherapy with Inversus and we also are a protocol biopsy program. We have protocol biopsies done at three months, 12 months post-transplant, and we do follow-up biopsies one month after treatment for rejection. We do biopsies for increased DSAs, rising BK viuria, and we do biopsies before and after immunosuppression conversion, such as switching to bladicept or mTOR inhibitors. We also do biopsies for cause when there's proteinuria or increased creatinine, for example. Let me discuss the first case. This is a young woman, 36 years old, who was transplanted September 9th of 2019. Due to the COVID pandemic, we've been limiting face-to-face -face visits to patients who have an absolute need for such visits and talk with her this time was through telehealth. She would have been due for a protocol biopsy due to the fact that she was going to change immunosuppression. Her original kidney disease was IgA nephropathy, she has immunosuppression with cyclosporin MMF, a baseline creatinine of 1.2. Her active issues are gum hypertrophy and hair growth, believed to be a complication from cyclosporin. This is the reason that we're switching her to baladicept. She had two pregnancies, and she's on cyclosporin because she developed diabetes with the pregnancies, and we were concerned she would develop post-transplant diabetes with tacrolimus but now she's bothered by the hair growth and gum hypertrophy. So our plan was to switch her to baladicept, and instead of the protocol biopsy, we did a true graph since she was very reluctant to come into the hospital and be exposed to um, other patients or staff that might have COVID. I noticed that a lot of our transplant patients are very, very scared about getting COVID. True graph showed graft excellence, and so we proceeded to converting her to baladicept. She also had negative DSAs, and we were comfortable then proceeding with baladicept conversion, and we plan to recheck the true graft in one month. A second case is a 24-year-old woman I've taken care of since she was a child. She has congenital dysplastic kidneys, mega ureter, uh, reflux nephropathy with multiple reimplantations, she also has bladder dysfunction. Her father had a similar condition and ended up on dialysis and, and had a kidney transplant, which has been successful for a number of years. She had a living unrelated donor transplant from her boyfriend 
and this was a preemptive transplant, so she was not on dialysis. Our immunosuppression was monotherapy with Envarsis XR, and although she had excellent kidney function initially with a creatinine of 1.1, it rose quite a few times after the transplant, and there were complications with borderline acute rejection. She was treated with steroids that was finished in October, and then she had multiple episodes of bladder dysfunction as well as possible transplant stenosis of the ureter. So her creatinine now remains between 1.6 and 2, and the creatinine does fluctuate. There was a repeat biopsy after her initial rejection that showed 10% interstitial inflammation, um, but no evidence of acute rejection. There was interstitial fibrosis. Her DSAs and C4D have been negative. She has a very thick, small bladder, and she had a nepho, nephroureteral stent that's now been removed. Because of all these complicated issues, as her creatinine does rise frequently, there's often the question of whether we should do a kidney biopsy. She's quite resistant to any interventions, does not want any further urologic procedures, and she also, also does not want to have a kidney biopsy, especially with uh, the COVID epidemic going on. She had an unrelated episode of Coombs positive anemia in March, so this is a very complicated patient. So our plan was, although we might usually do a repeat renal biopsy with an increased creatinine, especially with the cellular acute, uh, the, the history of cellular rejection, in this case we did a true graph and we got a transplant excellent result, which reassured us that acute rejection was not playing a role in her fluctuating creatinine and that a biopsy was not necessary. In summary, TrueGath has allowed us to eliminate protocol biopsies at this time in the COVID era, and many patients do not want to have these elective procedures done. But we will likely continue to replace our protocol biopsies with TrueGraph now that we've had more experience and feel comfortable with the results that we're getting. Since we also convert from calcineurin inhibitors to bladicep frequently, monitoring with TrueGraph allows us to at least avoid two biopsies and also monitor some months after the conversion to make sure there's no episodes of acute rejection. Thank you for allowing me to discuss these cases with you today and our use of TrueGraph. True our next speaker is Niraj Singh. Dr. Singh is the Medical Director of Kidney and Pancreas Transplantation at the John C. McDonald Regional Transplant Center and is an Associate Professor of Medicine at LSU Health Sciences Center in Shreveport, Louisiana. Dr. Singh will speak to us on the real-life use of TrueGraph versus cell-free DNA for monitoring renal transplant patients. Dr. Singh. These are my disclosures. As we know, serum creatinine and kidney biopsy have been the only tools to monitor kidney allografts for rejection for past many decades. Recently, we have seen several non-invasive assays become available, and two of them, TrueGraph and uh, donor-derived cell-free DNA have received CMS approval and are currently being adopted by several transplant centers across the country for immune monitoring post-transplant. TrueGraph, which is a blood gene expression assay, is uh, intended for use in uh, kidney transplant recipients with uh, stable renal function as an alternative to surveillance biopsies. The TrueGraph result is reported either as TX, which means transplant excellence, or non-TX. A TX result rules out subclinical rejection with a high probability and hence the need for a protocol biopsy. A non-TX result, on the other hand, may suggest suboptimal immunosuppression or immune activation. The donor-derived cell-free DNA is available through several companies, including KRDX, which makes Alishore, Netera, which makes Prospera, and Viracor, which makes Track. The donor-derived cell-free DNA is a marker of acute allograft injury and is supposed to assess the probability of rejection in uh, kidney transplant recipients presenting with acute kidney injury. At our center, we use Alishore post-kidney transplant in patients presenting with uh, acute kidney injury to assess the possibility of rejection. In addition, we use Alishore monthly up to 6 months and then at 9 and 12 months 
followed by quarterly up to three years post-transplant as part of an immune surveillance protocol. In addition, patients also undergo true graft testing at the same time interval. But we use uh, true graft only in a subset of patients considered to be at high risk for rejection, including those with high PRA, more than 80%, retransplants, kidney transplant recipients of uh, DCD kidneys, patients undergoing bilatacept conversion, and uh, patients younger than uh, 30 years old. Next, uh, we will go over a couple of uh, cases to describe how we have utilized immune monitoring in our patients post-transplant. So case one is a 59-year-old African-American male with history of uh, end-stage renal disease secondary to diabetes mellitus type 2 and hypertension who underwent a deceased donor kidney transplant in September last year. Pre-transplant, his PRA was 0%. He received a kidney from a CMV0 positive donor, although he himself was CMV0 negative. This was a 5 antigen mismatch transplant from a 58 year old donor with KDPS score of 83% and a cold ischemia time of 18 hours. His uh, immunosuppression medications consisted of uh, mycophenolate morphetil 1 gram twice a day, Inversus XR 8 mg PO once a day, and uh, prednisone 5 mg PO once a day. Post transplant, his creatinine came down in the range of 2.5 to 3.0. But did not get any better than this. In uh, late January, his serum creatinine uh, was noticed to be trending up. After transplant, we try to keep the tacrolimus levels in the range of 8 to 12, at least up to 3 to 6 months post transplant. Uh, patient had a couple of tacrolimus levels uh, which were below therapeutic range. As serum creatinine continued to trend up, uh, AKI workup was ordered, which included a negative BK and CMV virus PCR, negative donor specific antibody, a urine analysis, which was unremarkable, and urine protein to creatinine ratio, which was only 0.3. He also had a normal kidney ultrasound. A patient had been undergoing allosure serial monitoring, and they were all below the cutoff. In addition, patient uh, had a track ordered at the time of his EKI as part of a study correlating the track with allosure and it was also below cutoff. Patient had a true graph result of TX a month prior which had now become non-TX. Due to uh, suspicion for rejection, patient uh, underwent a transplant kidney biopsy and as shown in this figure, the panel on the left side shows uh, mild ATN, and uh, panel on the B and panel on the uh, right side shows uh, patient had uh, uh, at least 40 to 50 percent peritubular capillaries, which were positive for C4D. So, despite having a negative DSA, uh, a diagnosis of uh, antibody mediated rejection was made, and uh, patient underwent six sessions of plasmapheresis along with IVIG followed by one dose of rituximab. In addition, he also received a solimeterol IV taper. With the above treatment, his serum creatinine trended down uh, to 2.8 at the time of his last follow-up. Uh, patient uh, also has a uh, true graph result of TX uh, at his last follow-up. Case 2 uh, is a 27-year-old African-American female with history of uh, end-stage renal disease secondary to hypertension who underwent a deceased donor kidney transplant in September last year. Pre-transplant, her PRA was 24%. This was a 4 mismatch transplant and both donor and uh, recipient were CMV0 negative. She received a kidney from a 38-year-old donor with the KDPS score of 43% and cold ischemia time of 9 hours 46 minutes. Her immunosuppression medications consisted of uh, mycophenolate morphetil, 750 mg PO twice a day, Inversus XR, 10 mg PO once a day and prednisone 5 mg PO once a day. 
Her serum creatinine came down in the range of 1.9 to 2.2 mg per deciliter after transplant. In uh, January, her serum creatinine uh, was noticed to be trending up along with uh, uh, anemia and thrombocytopenia. She had a kidney ultrasound ordered as part of an uh, outpatient workup for AKI and this was unremarkable. Concomitant with the rise in the serum creatinine, she was noticed to have a couple of uh, tacrolimus levels which were on the high side. The inversus which was at 12 mg PO once a day was initially put on hold and then the dose was reduced to 10 mg PO once a day. But uh, despite that, her serum creatinine continued to trend up. PK and CMV PCR were both negative. Uh, donor specific antibody was also negative. She had some significant proteinuria of 1.2 gram. Alishore was reported to be negative as well as well as the uh, track. Uh, she had a true graph result of Tx a couple of weeks before, which had now become non-Tx. Due to progressively rising serum creatinine, patient underwent a transplant kidney biopsy, which showed evidence of borderline rejection, along with the findings of thrombotic macroangiopathy. So this next slide shows uh, the kidney biopsy slides with the panel A showing a thickening of the vessel wall, panel B showing some mixoid changes within the vessel wall, panel C showing fragmented RBCs in the blood vessel and uh, panel D is uh, immunofluorescence of the blood vessel showing fibrino fibrinogen staining in the blood vessel. These are her rest of labs. Her peripheral blood smear showed evidence of schistocytes. She had uh, elevated LDH, low haptoglobin, and a low complement C3. Her Adams 13 activity was in the normal range. Due to findings of uh, renal dysfunction, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, and thrombocytopenia, a diagnosis of atypical HUS was made. She underwent a further genetic workup which confirmed factor H heterozygous mutation with low factor H level. Incidentally, patient also had a low factor I level. Due to uh, borderline rejection on the biopsy, she was uh, initiated on a solimeteral IV taper. She also underwent uh, five sessions of plasmapheresis with FFP infusion for her findings of uh, TMA on the biopsy. But uh, despite that, her serum creatinine uh, did not uh, respond uh, and it continued to trend up. By that time, we had received uh, approval for using Eclusimab uh, for her uh, atypical HUS and she received uh, four doses a week apart following which her serum creatinine trended down. A follow-up kidney biopsy showed uh, improvement in the TMA as well as no rejection. She was uh, also noticed to have improvement in her proteinuria. Her allosure uh, stayed uh, negative uh, as well as track and uh, also her true graph stayed non-TX. If we look at the reported uh, performance statistics of uh, donor-derived cell-free DNA and true graph, both these tests have a moderate sensitivity, specificity, as well as positive predictive value. But both of them have a very high negative predictive value for rejection. Donor-derived cell-free DNA for ruling out uh, active cell-mediated or antibody-mediated rejection, and true graph for ruling out silent or subclinical rejection. However, these the two cases show us that true graph may be helpful in picking up molecular signatures of underlying immune activation or rejection in patients having acute kidney injury post kidney transplant. We will need further studies to define the role of true graph in patients with acute kidney injury, including those undergoing four cause biopsies post kidney transplantation. Uh, with this, uh, uh, I want to thank you all and I will be happy to answer any questions.